What's up with that, John? Go ahead. No problem. All good? Yeah. You're, we're in a short throw. You probably won't be on camera for most of this, but that's all right. at least we'll get your audio. That's all right. That's all. Yeah, no we, probably, we talked about that. I'm going to try to catch it. I am pretty, but, you know. Oh. <laughs> all right. Examination versus analysis. A subtle but distinct difference, right? So we're talking about the examination part. We're talking about the process. We're talking about the extraction of data, getting it into a condition where it can be analyzed. So we talked about the differences there as far as analysis goes. We're actually going to take that data once it's been extracted and processed, and now we're going to interpret it. We're going to, we're going to in the context of the specific case we're working on, we're now going to figure out what this means. All right, we're going to do some, there's all kinds of different analysis we may have to perform as well. So by processing or in the extraction or examination phase, we're going to get it in a condition to be analyzed. So now we go on to the analysis piece. So when we're going to do this analysis, we're going to have to use well-documented <laughs> methods. Why do they have to be well-documented? What does that really mean? It needs to be repeatable. It needs to be repeatable. Right, exactly. What else? You might interpret that well-documented to be that they are widely accepted practices, right? Because if you're out there on the bleeding edge, the courts are a little bit hesitant <coughs> to hang a... Uh, legal decision based on science that really hasn't been proven or well documented or accepted across you know a certain scientific community if you will. You may ever watch the Casey Anthony trial? You guys remember the bleeding edge forensic science they introduced in that one? If you get a chance it's well worth your time to go to Google that and YouTube Dr. Voss in the Casey Anthony case. Voss or Boss? Voss. V A S V A A S. Maybe V A S S. Basically what they did in that case was they, you know, part of the, at least the prosecution's theory was that Casey Anthony murdered her child and part of the, the plot was to use chloroform. And they, they, they hypothesized that Casey Anthony, when she committed the murder, actually knocked her child out with the uh, chloroform and put her dead body in the trunk. And that body stayed in that trunk long enough for decomposition to begin. And that left a distinct odor. If anybody has ever smelled a decaying body, you will actually you will never forget that smell. You know it instantly when you smell one. So I get that, but that is, a, that is an artifact. That is a unique smell. So what they tried to introduce was they tried to capture the odor out of that trunk days later in a can. And then they tried to analyze it. So they get this guy that is an anthropologist. I guess they, they pounded him on that. He's got no background in it. And on and on and on. It's well worth your time to look at that so you can see what happens to these uh, scientific uh, processes that haven't been tested, that haven't been researched, that haven't been published and talked about. I guess that's the pop up. So, so yeah. does that make it right if the lawyers don't understand the, the method? No, it, but it's an argument. That's the thing. All you, you gotta do is convince the jury. I mean, that's it. Well, you got to convince the judge first. Well, yeah, but you got to convince the judge first, and, and in this case, he let that in, and then, then you, then you, then that expert's got to stand up to that cross examination by the defense lawyer about this has never been proven, this has never been published, you know, you're not a chemist, on and on and on. So it was a little mysterious to me why they put that guy on in the first place because he was definitely out of his element. So the, the analysis piece, we're going to try to answer the questions that started the case. Answer the questions that started the case. Different types of analysis. More than one type of analysis out there. Relational analysis. What kind of stuff could that be? Okay, putting things in context of one another. All right, good. What else can we do with that? We can fill the timeline. Timelines, okay. Let's go be under another kind of analysis, but you're close. What else? How things are connected, how people are connected, how devices are connected, that kind of stuff. How things are, how one, one thing is related to another. You could have different devices, you could have different artifacts, such as an email. Etc. 
So you want to try to identify the connections between the suspect, the victim, and the scene, for example. And maybe one uh, key part of your analysis is trying to put somewhere, somebody someplace at a certain time, or connect someone to another person, or connect someone to a specific file. How we do that in the digital side is through IP addresses, email addresses, physical locations, etc. You can also do that with telephone numbers. One of the things that's popular in law enforcement is dumping their phones, and you've got almost a ready-built conspiracy case in a lot of drug, you know, call that drug trafficking. You dump that phone and those tools like Celebrite will automatically create one of these link analysis. Looks just like that little diagram I had before. And identify who are the heavy connections, who is talking to someone more or less. Stand and found out that they did not have 
a, a uh, nick in it. That'd be a problem, wouldn't it? It's easy to assume that these things are, are working the way they're supposed to. But that's a bad idea. Last but not least is everybody's favorite part, right? The sexy part is that reporting, but it is probably the most critical. These reports, and this could be a top, the topic of a whole other talk, is those reports have got to be detailed, should be, although there is some schools of thought on some, some, some uh, agencies and organizations favorable a minimalistic approach that have possibly, you know, one or two pages, and then you've got folks on the totally other end of the spectrum that um, favor a much larger, more detailed report. Yes, ma'am. Discoverable? I don't. Also, or is that different? Because I'm just wondering if right. things are so different from when I used to. Yeah, I don't. I think. I think not. Yeah. It's work product. Because we actually had. I don't know if you did this, but we actually had to be very careful how we even took notes because we right. knew that could be called in. It's so, good practice not to put like your opinions. Like, uh, oh damn, this dude's guilty as you know, yeah. on there. Um, <laughs> I just wonder but how that works. typically, what, as far as I understand it goes, your work, your bench notes. Your notes are work product, and they're not discoverable unless you take them to the witness stand with you. If it goes to the stand, you got to give it up. But those, but those detailed notes, those detailed notes form the foundation of that final report. So that's why they're extremely important. So it's a lot of this, like you know, CSI kind of generation. Everyone expects forensics to be perfect. Um, Go back to the velocity. Do you find that it's better to be more verbose to convince a jury that you actually know what you're talking about, or is it succinct better to, you know, it, it, if it's too far over their heads and are you going to bog them down with detail? Well, <coughs> that's a great that's a great question. I think you've got to balance that out because who you're writing the report for? You're not writing it for me and other professional. You're writing it for the lawyer, the judge, and the jury, right? So it needs to be any, any jargon or acronym that you use need to be explain and, and, and make sure you're not talking over their head because what happens is as soon as you start overwhelming them with jargon and acronyms, what's going to happen to their, their eyes are going to roll back in their head and they're done. I mean, I've, I've seen that multiple times. Um, I think we need to be very, very, very aware of who we're writing for, who we're presenting to, and take all that into account. Um, I don't know that the length of the report is there's a fine line, and this is where it's an art, I think, as far as like walking that knife edge, as far as the more you put down, uh, the, the, the maybe an info set turn, the more attack surface you've got for the other side, right? So there's a fine line in showing what you did and showing, you know, a lot of it, both, I think, boils down to showing the other expert that you knew that you knew what you were doing, and the other lawyer. Because if that report is sloppy and you're not explaining it well, they smell blood in the water, they're going to dig into you like nobody's business because they think if that report is sloppy, the underlying forensic analysis must be sloppy. So that may provoke that meeting shyster, right? Jump on you. So that report needs to include things like what did you do and what did you do it with, and then your conclusions, all right, supported by what? Evidence. You don't make any assertions that you don't support with actual evidence. And it's not all written. It could be screenshots. It should be screenshots, all right, that are tight, well done, not a lot of extraneous information, captions on and on, all right? Critical. That report is absolutely critical. I'm going to say that's a whole other talk. That's a great point. All right, let's talk about questions a little more. What time are we done here? As I said before, that evidence has got to answer a wide array of questions. It's kind of role-based. So investigators are going to ask investigative type questions, all right? We are going to ask kind of technical and forensic kind of questions. And the lawyers are going to want to know legal, the answers to some legal questions. So we're talking about the investigative questions. We're back to that same standard, who, what, why, where, when, and how. That's the role of the investigator in any case. Who, what, why, where, when, and how, all right? Now, the question becomes, oops, all right, 
Who you guys working in a digital forensics lab right now? Anybody? Anybody do this on a regular basis? Okay. One of the things when evidence hits the door, typically it's going to have to have some paperwork with it, right? It's going to have to have some paperwork with it. So it'll arrive in the lab. You'll get a box. If, it, if they're going to ship it to you, you'll get a box. And inside that box will contain some base documentation like search warrants, case submission report. But one thing you don't have typically is the case report. So you got really not a lot of context. All right? But you still got to review what little documentation you've got. <clears throat> There's an examination request, perhaps, and it's typically a form. A lot of times these forms have only got one line or certain entries in that form. So it's not, <clears throat> there's some room for improvement in a lot of these forms because once, you, once that hits the door, a lot of times as an examiner, you're left to infer what they want done. You don't know all the nuance. You, you haven't investigated the case. You haven't interviewed all the witnesses and suspects. So you've got to do a lot of inference. Okay? Oftentimes in a criminal case in the lab, the best piece of uh, documentation you're going to get is going to be the search warrant. This, particularly the affidavit, that's going to be probably the most detailed account of what happened and kind of give you, give you the first indication of what you're looking for. This is a huge problem, I think, because it makes the examination and analysis way less efficient and way more time consuming and could induce or introduce more error into the whole process and perhaps have evidence overlooked. Because the, the people doing the examination and the analysis, okay, if they're doing any analysis, because a lot of times, actually, in a criminal case, a lot of times they're basically dumping the data and pushing it back to the investigator. And they're often left with the analysis piece. Because of those external pressures of a huge backlog. I know the backlog now at the, the lab at our, at our place is like 9 to 12 months to turn around a piece of evidence. And there's a lot, there's labs out there that you have even a longer backlog. Are they spending significant time on, like, or any time at all, like, in the training academies? Because I know back when I did civil law, some of the department had a officer did his own forensic collection and everything was submitted versus other places where a team would come in. But when you have to do that, they would teach the academy how to do it. They yeah, there is some, there is some entry academy. level training. I think it's maybe, it's maybe six hours wow. on digital evidence. Not a lot. And then typically in West Virginia, it's not, I mean, the in-service is not a lot. I mean, you get that first initial shot of, hey, there's digital evidence out there. Here's some kind of basic approaches to it, but that's it. So if they mess that collection up, it doesn't even matter. Right. The lab. Yeah. I mean, and then they try, they, they're doing their best with it. And a lot of times, it's, uh, you know, I haven't seen any colossal failures yet on the, in that, but I, it, it could come for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So oftentimes, we do not get those investigative reports that could be, I think, very helpful in making our examination and analysis way more efficient and effective. So what is the tasking? What, are we, what the tasking is what they're asking us to do. Tasking is basically what they're asking us to do. And again, oftentimes, sadly, it's, in, it's basically implied. Here's a homicide case. Here's who maybe you might get a suspect. You might, not, you might not know the suspect, but you get very minimal information, really. And it's left to us to kind of figure it out, which is kind of scary. So that tasking should, all right, try to help you answer that who, what, why, where, when, and how, all right? Thing is, if you don't get that information up front, we've got to start asking for it. We've got to start asking for it. I think we need to start training those first responders and our clients and our customers and our management that this is the information we need. And it's going to be very helpful for us, for example, they provide us things like date ranges, all right? When did, when did this activity allegedly occur? Okay, because we've got that giant mountain of data, right? And only a fraction of it is going to be relevant. So we need this kind of basic information for us to be able to filter out the irrelevant from the relevant. So things like date ranges, file types, email addresses, anything that can help us search through that giant digital haystack for those few needles that we need. Here's a war story. Last summer, I got approached by one of the local police departments and they brought me this. 
from your grocery bag full of these items. So what I've got there, you can't really see it, there are three laptop hard drives, there are four external drives, there's one of those uh, my books, a terabyte, and two iPads and a GoPro with a, with a, a media card in it. So anybody got kind of, how long do you think it would take to go through all that and image it? There's probably eh, almost a full of shit a bite in there. <laughs> you know? So the problem was, you know, the case here is they had a excuse me, an individual they thought was having sex with a girl who was underage. And they thought that she may be that he may be reporting these sexual encounters uh, unbeknownst to his partners. So <clears throat> I didn't know where to start. So what, one of the things that I did was triage. I called the investigator back and said, hey, out of all these devices, which one do you think may have the most relevant data on it? For example, it might be most recent, something that they didn't want to give up that they hid, that kind of stuff. So I did get a little bit of a clue on that. And then I started to triage everything. I hooked everything up to a right block so I wouldn't compromise it. And then I kind of scanned through it all. See if I can find you know, just what was there, get a lay of the land. So that's one idea or one kind of a problem. If I had to image all that and then go through all that, it would be a massive problem. So what I ended up finding in that case was on one of the external drives, he did indeed have several videos buried down in a directory of him having sex with three different women. Both of them, though, were uh, overage, but, the, but none of them gave consent. Also found video of him from the military, where he's actually trying his system out, where he's got a remote camera, and you see him walking across this large room with an iPad, and he's waving at it and looking at it. And also during one of the uh, videos of him having sex, you see him reach behind a pillow and pull out the iPad, and he's watching it at the same time. So he got, I think, a year in jail over that. So we're a team. We are part of a team. In a criminal or a legal context, we've got us, the examiners, you've got the investigators, you've also got the lawyers. And we've all got to be talking to one another throughout this process more than we're doing it because I think we're leaving, we're leaving stuff on the table. We're leaving things on the table that could be very relevant. So here's some examples of what I'm talking about. You'd ask them kind of, what information are you needing? What are you trying to prove with this? Why do you need it? Why do you need it? Now, that may seem a little bit, maybe rude's not the right word, but presumptive, like, why would I ask the lawyer why you need it? Okay? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because... A lot of times, you're going to be the only one that's going to eyeball this stuff with any, you know, over any length of time, right? You're going to be the only one that's going to be able to eyeball this stuff. And if you see things, all right, and you don't know the details of the nuance, you, there may be some really great evidentiary nuggets in there that you're going to overlook, all right? But if you have that context of what they're trying to prove and why do you need it, you can recognize those things that are beyond the scope or beyond that original tasking. How are you going to use it? Like, I'm going to use this to prove motive. I need stuff to prove motive. I need stuff to prove that they were connected. I need this to show X. All right? That's going to provide you with the context to be able to make independent decisions. All right? When you're combing through all this stuff. Why is that so important? Because I can't put the, sus the suspect with the victim any other way. Or I need to be able to show that those two were in a relationship prior to the event. On and off. One thing to watch out for is scope creep. What's scope creep? Anybody know? When uh, your targeted task expands past what right. your target. That original tasking, right? When I did this stuff for civil cases, this got to be a big problem because they're paying, you got the attorneys or the client paying around 350 or 400 bucks an hour, right? Or you're going to bill that. And you get an original tasking of, let's say, examine this hard drive, and uh, you want to, uh, they don't give you much information. All right, so we try to help them narrow that down. But what can happen is you can, that 
bill, that billable hour quickly cranks up, right? And they you may be billing for hours they didn't approve. So what can happen there is if you're going to get your contracted to do X, all right, so many hours, for example, or by a device, per device, all right, and all of a sudden you start to find a few things and you let the lawyer know what you're seeing. All of a sudden, hey, if you're in there, do this. Well, while you're doing that, do this. And they don't, it's not documented. You do that on the fly through email, it's not documented. Well, then you may have a problem with getting the bills paid. So that can be a problem while you're doing this. Let's talk about hypotheses in just a minute. So just like we talked about from those different kinds of questions, it goes back to those roles, investigators, lawyers, and clients, forensic practitioners, all right? Just like each of us come at this from different roles for the questions, we do the same thing with hypotheses. And a hypothesis is a very, very key component, especially if we're going to be, be utilizing the scientific method, which we should be because this is still forensics, all right? So we're going to look at investigative, legal, and forensic hypotheses. Each one is going to have, each one of these roles will have a different hypothesis or question. And it's going to be a critical part of the plan. It's, it's these hypotheses that I'm going to show you about here in a minute. It's going to help guide you through an examination and analysis, keep you on track, and let you know when you're done. When enough is enough. So like I said, it's part of the scientific method. So what exactly is the scientific method? It's a method of, a method of procedure that has characterized natural science since the 17th century, consisting in systematic observation, measurement, and experiment, and the formulation, testing, and modification of hypothesis, hypotheses. All right? So when, when the courts, for example, look at this, they, this is what they want to see. All right? This is, this is the, the way that DNA is presented. It's the way that toxicology is presented. And we're, they're, you know, we need to get on board because this is coming for digital. We've been able to, to kind of skirt around this on the edges a little bit. But there's a changes coming in forensic science, and they're going to start looking at all of this a lot harder. So what's a hypothesis? All right? Basically, a supposition or proposed explanation made on the basis of limited evidence as a starting point for further investigation. So it's going to be the starting point. That's the key part of this. So I'm going to suggest to you today that by crafting these hypotheses at the start of the investigation, before you open up the software, it's going to provide you with the ability to laser focus in on just what you need to do, how you need to do it, and ensure that you, you don't go too far, so you're not wasting time and resources. You go far enough to prove the case, and you also don't leave anything behind. So let's look at an example now. Here's a regular hypothesis. You might hypothesize that the suspect used email on this particular computer to communicate with the victim. Size of your computer is infected. <laughs> it's got that stupid uh, that pop up to hook up to the uh, Wi-Fi. All right. So again, before you start, before you open up the software, before you get going, you're going to digest that documentation. You're going to talk to the client, the customer, the investigator, the lawyer, get a real handle on what's going on, and then you can start to craft these hypotheses. But you do this before you start. What you need to do, I would suggest here, is going to create things, something I would call a falsifiable hypothesis. What do I mean by that? So in our other example, we had you hypothesize that the suspect used this, this computer to communicate with the victim through email. All right? So to make that a falsifiable hypothesis, you would just say, I will not find evidence that, this, that the suspect has communicated with the victim on this computer. So then you can show either you can either prove or disprove that, or it can be indeterminate. Okay? So there you've got some clear guidelines. So now I know what I'm trying to find, and now I know where to look. So the more clearly and precisely you can figure these out, the more clearly and precisely you can figure these out, the more efficient and effective that examination is going to be. Now let's take a little bit of an example, then we'll break for lunch. All right, John Doe is an employee of XYZ Corporation. As an employee, he travels for business, 
and is reimbursed by XYZ for his, his expenses. By company policy, John is required to submit a travel voucher along with original receipts to the company. John is suspected of submitting fraudulent travel claims between January 1st, 2015 and the present by utilizing altered receipts. There are indications that Doe takes his original receipts, scans them, and modifies them utilizing Photoshop, increasing the amount to be paid. The evidence submitted for examination is Doe's company-owned desktop computer. An examination is requested to locate any files or data associated with the travel claims, vouchers, receipts, and travel documents on that computer. So from the investigative side, again that who, where, and what, John Doe utilized that computer to submit travel vouchers. He did so between January 1, 2015 and the present. He utilized Photoshop to alter those original receipts. That's the how. Why he did so to obtain additional money. Now the legal stuff, what you've got to prove in court. John Doe is an employee of XYZ Corporation. John Doe performed authorized travel for the corporation. John Doe is authorized reimbursement for this travel. John Doe is aware of the company's travel policies, including the need to provide original receipts for expenses. Lastly, John Doe knowingly and willfully altered the original receipts, increased their value, and submitted them to the company and received compensation to which he was not entitled. Now, our part of this. XYZ travel vouchers will be found on the suspect's computer. Receipts supporting these vouchers will be found on the suspect's computer. Original unaltered receipts will be found on the suspect's computer. Receipts showing alteration will be found on the suspect's computer. Software capable of altering the original receipts will be located on the suspect's computer. Indication that such software was used to alter the original receipts will be located on the suspect's computer. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Why did not make the alterations on his computer and then on another computer? Say again? Why did not make the alterations on his work computer? Why did not make alterations to the reimbursement? No, in, in the context of this example, you don't know that the, that the other device exists. All you're going to be able to show is on that computer, you, you, were, not, you were not able to prove that particular hypothesis, right? Okay. Yeah, so I mean, that, there may be other indications that another device was used, and that might point you in that direction, but all, if you've got just what you've got, that one desktop computer. All right, so this examination plan, we've got to start working smarter and not harder. That's what all this is about, working smarter and not harder. You need to be efficient. We've got to be able to do this, to be able to fight that backlog, relieve the pressure on us. Do those examinations as quickly and as effectively as we can without leaving evidence behind. So, kind of tough to, to, to design one of these examination plans. It's not easy. It's hard to design these examination strategies based solely on these investigative or, le or legal questions. So for example, what do you need to come up with on this examination plan is right out of the gate. What hardware do I use for my examination and analysis? What software do I need? What examination strategies and search techniques will be the most effective given the evidence at hand in the context of this particular case? How far do I have to go? How do you know when you're done? So the early days, all right, thought process was since any data could be hidden anywhere, all right, all the data should be examined. All right, and when you were talking about you know, 512 megabyte hard drives, that may be possible. All right, that does not scale today. That does not scale. That could be thought of as a thorough examination mindset, all right? 
I started out way back in the day. And the court's pretty cool with it, all right? Because their computers are kind of had a limited, kind of more clearly defined use, all right? I'm using that computer at the house just to do my taxes, or I'm just surfing the internet, okay? But times, they are definitely changing, all right? They are definitely changing. Computers are now have a huge, much greater role in our everyday life. We've got cell phones that travel with us 24-7, 365, right? Think about all the pictures that are on your phone, all the videos, all the texts, all the private messages, all that stuff. Think about the massive amount of data that could be now stored, personal data, medical data, communications, all that stuff. And a ton of it can be now stored and carried around in our pockets, and all these various devices. So the course, the courts now are less receptive to this idea, this complete review of everything that's in that hard drive. Okay? They are getting less tolerant of a complete and thorough review of everything that's on the drive. Yes, ma'am. When you get a search warrant, is the search warrant to take the entire device or does the search warrant drill down into what parts of the device you you need to get more specific, right? It's, it's now the device, and also depending on the um, how the device was used in the commission of the crime. So you may be able to look at like this, but you can't look at that. Right, and that, that's going that's where you need to get because that's you got to start to to be be more precise in exactly what you want to find. So they're getting less tolerant. This started out the most recent case an example of this is the Supreme Court case, probably been two or three years ago, from California regarding a cell phone. And that's going to that's going to travel over to everything. So you're not going to be able to just get in there and open it up and just go through everybody's stuff willy nilly. You guys are digging my Ruth Bader Ginsburg icon, right? <laughs> so the courts are definitely going to favor a more targeted approach. Just opening up somebody's hard drive and going through all their stuff is going to be less and less tolerated. So what does that mean to us as examiners? We have got to have an endpoint. We've got to be able to clearly define and articulate what we want to look for, right, and how we're going to do it. So we need to start articulating those examination goals and objectives. And one way we can do that is with those falsifiable hypotheses, all right? Those are good, clearly defined ways to kind of set the guardrails and set an endpoint. So what was searched? Why it was searched? Under what legal authority was it searched? There's that word, if you guys are in law enforcement, that's seen this before, that objectively reasonable. All right? Was it reasonable for you to go looking where you were looking? If you're looking for X, why are you digging in Y? All right? There has to be a reason. So back to the examination process kind of thing, that old adage of garbage in equals what? Garbage out, right? I think we're in that situation now as far as our examination planning and the information we're getting in. Okay? Not that it's bad, it's just not enough. Any questions so far? So who makes those determinations of what you can and can't? As the examiner or lawyer or Well you're gonna get second guess. Typically like all things in law enforcement, the cops or the examiners are gonna make a judgment call, probably at the moment. And then that's going to be second guessed down the road. And the penalty there is if you were wrong, whatever you did was excluded. That kind of thing. So it all hinges on the search warrant first. We're talking about a criminal context. Search warrant is key. And those affidavits are, you guys, there's a thing called the Four Corners Doctrine, where the, the only thing you can argue about in a search warrant is what's contained in the four corners of that document. You can't. Read any inferring in there, anything you said to the judge can't be counted. It's only, only what is written on the page is what matters. So if you didn't articulate that in the in the affidavit, it's out of bounds as far as the courts are concerned. So that garbage in, garbage out is the same with digital forensic exams. I'm here to advocate for more input, all right? More input, more information at the front end so we can get a better product at the back end, right? But what happens here, this results in bad outcomes for everybody involved, all right? This can result in bad outcomes for everybody. Investigators, clients, and customers are disappointed. 
So I've got a question. Um, is it a lack of fundamental understanding between what you do and what they're asking? Is that why they're asking bad questions? I think it's I think it's strange. I think it, I think it's it's not that they're it's not that they're stupid or dumb or bad. It's that they just don't know. And that they're also feeling pressure. They've also got a backlog of cases. They've also got time constraints and everything else. So I think it's just a matter of trying to figure out a way that what is enough, what is not all of it, but just what's enough to make this work. Does that make sense? So I'm trying to find that sweet spot that knife edge to balance on. So what the uh, poorly designed or no plan, all right, can lead to, to uh, bad outcomes for everybody, disappointed investigators, clients, and customers because, you know, you didn't bring them their case on a silver platter. Dude, this is forensic science, man. I've seen it on TV. That's a smoking gun. It's got to be in there. It's a computer. You know, are you that stupid? It's got to be there. Well, maybe it's not. But a lot of times the expectation is if I've got a, a device, then I've got the case. Because if it's a widget, it's got to have stuff in it. Not always the case. As far as we're concerned, it forces us into this kind of unfocused and needless, forming these unfocused and needless operations on the data. We're constantly clicking and spinning. We're just poking around. We get lost in the click hole, right? Wasting time. You guys want to do lunch? You want to ride this out? Want lunch? <laughs> Who wants to stay? Do that. Two people, three people. Good lunch? Good for lunch? You guys are interactive. <laughs> Alright, let's go to lunch.